spent with my friends, right? And it's okay to have friends, but in a well-balanced manner where you're not overtaking the rights of those whom you're supposed to what? Fulfill your rights towards your family, your parents, your siblings, your, uncles, your aunts. And subhanAllah, in this day and age, we've become people who gather a lot together. We get a lot together, but to be honest, we're isolated from one another. And I'm sure you guys can all relate, right? We say, okay, there's a family reunion. Okay, great. We're all there, sitting in the same room, eating from the same table, the same food, but each and every single one of us is in their own little virtual world. We've been slowly and steadily cut from one another, not just in your unions, but in our own small homes with our own small families. And the adult of even communicating with each other at home has been overtaken by what? This little thing, which has become our first and foremost priority. True or false? True? You, you agree with me or not? You do, right? There's so many things we need to put each other. Instagram, oh my god, who did this? Who did that? I have to post, right? I have to keep on, I have to keep clicking. There's something there that keeps pulling me. And, but it's pulling me, but it's taking me away from what I'm supposed to be doing with my family. Now, the more you decide to put this down and start getting back again and connecting with your family, you are doing something that is a great weight in the scale of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even if at sometimes it might seem to you just simply as socializing, right? You're visiting your aunt, what are you doing? Sitting, chit-chatting, eating some biscuits that you make free or scones, whatever you guys call them here, right? And drinking some tea, back when we drink coffee. But basically that's what you're doing, you're chit-chatting with her. But wallahi, if you do with the right niyyah, you are actually pulling and getting the baraka into your life because you're maintaining those ties that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the rahim, He would maintain with you if you maintained it with the rahim. Do you get what I'm saying? Now, I know you guys are all at the age of marriage, right? I don't know if anybody married or not yet, but at least you're about to get married, inshallah. So I have to hit on this as well, because your spouse and your children are going to be part of those, what? Silat al-Rahim as well. And there are many contracts that we sign in our life, right? We sign car contracts, apartment contracts, inshallah, soon to be job contracts, and so on. But the only contract that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called a solemn or heartfelt, sincere, not just contract, but a covenant, a covenant that the heavens and the earth would shape for if it were broken, is the covenant of, or the contract of what? Marriage. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls it what? A mitab ghalid, a solemn covenant, it's not a joke. And he says in Surah Nisa, verse 21, and he's talking to the wife and the husband here. We've taken from you what? A solemn covenant. The day you are signing that contract, the day you are putting your hand in your father-in-law's hand and telling him, I, and he tells you basically, I marry my daughter to you on what? Following the guidelines of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and based upon the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, these are serious words. You're following the guidelines of Allah and the mannerisms of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So what would happen if you don't follow these words? It's become a trend now. We're all consumed and worried about where we're going to get married, what dress we're going to buy, where the wedding's going to be, where we're going to spend our honeymoon. But we're not putting much detail or much concentration into what's after that. These things are going to last literally a day, a week, or a month. But how about the rest of your life? That's what you need to focus on and understand. It's a mitab khalib, right? And Mithaq Ali, just to understand how serious it is, is mentioned three times in the Qur'an. Once when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the prophets that he's taken from them, what? A solemn covenant. And the second time from Bani Israel, when he tells them, I'm taking from you a solemn covenant to what? Rectify the earth, Islah al And the third time is the day you are getting married. A solemn covenant from you and from your spouse, right? Could you possibly after that not fulfill the <coughs> Could you possibly after that not adorn your relationship with your spouse with the prophetic mannerisms? Now, I want to move to another point again to point out how important families before I just jump into talking about our adab with them, inshallah. The Quran. <coughs> we all read the Quran and we finish one khatma and two khatmas in Ramadan and, and I don't know, we do one khatma and this and that, right? But do we really pay attention? How much Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala focuses on the family in the Qur'an? The entire
entire Quran is filled with models of family. Okay, so let's look at this. Um, let's talk about spouses. You have Prophet Adam and his wife Hawa Adam and Sinan, right? Prophet Ibrahim and Sitna Hajim and Sitna Sara, right? Prophet Musa and his story of getting married. Let's look at about examples of fathers and their children. Prophet Dawood and Prophet Sulaiman alayhim as -salam. Prophet Ibrahim and his son, Ismail. Prophet, uh, who else? Let's look at siblings. Prophet Harun and Prophet Musa. Cousins, Isa and Yahya. Uh, mothers and their sons, Maryam and what? Isa alayhim as -salam. And Musa and Abu Musa. Father that doesn't get along with his son. Prophet what? Ibrahim and his father, Azar. Prophet Nuh and his son. How about those who get along? Prophet Dawood and Prophet Sulaiman. How about a sister and brother? Sayyidina Musa and his sister who saved him. How about siblings that don't get along? Prophet Yusuf and his brothers who tried to what? get rid of him. It's the family. The Quran is filled with stories from the family. Your family comes as number one. It is ranked as number one with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when I talk starting about rights now, you can kind of understand how serious this is, right? And I'm going to focus today on somebody which I think we all need to focus on, our parents, right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 233, No mother should be harmed through her child and no father through his child. You should never ever be the source of unhappiness of your parents. You should never be the source of their discomfort or shame. On the contrary, you should show them unconditional love, whether you get along with them or not, whether they're treating you the way you want to be treated or not, right? And if we look about parents, subhanAllah, it's literally like a training for our nafs, how to say salamana wa atana, but with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there are things that we're asked to do or not do, right? And the benefits for these things are explained to us. But there are other things that we are requested to do without questioning. I am your creator. I am telling you to do so and so. There is benefit in it for you, and you're not going to understand it. So what do we say? We hear and we obey Allah. Sabihna wa and the same concept with our parents. And of course, the day Mathal al-A'la, right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, What Baqada Rabbuka Allah ta'budu illa iya, wa bil walidayni ihsana, imma yabrugunna, yabrugunna, andaka al kibar ihdahuma, au kilahuma, fala taqul lahuma, uffim, wala tabharhuma, wa kul lahuma, kawlan kalima. And your Lord has decreed that you do not worship except Him, and to be dutiful to your parents. Right after being asked to worship nobody but him, what comes? Does it tell you go and pray to Hashem the light? Does it tell you go to this or that? No. Be dutiful to your parents. Right? You see where the parents fall, where the importance of your parents fall? Right after what worshiping nothing but him. And the ayah continues. Whether one or both of them reach old age while with you, not in a nursing home, not alone, with you, in your care. Doesn't matter how busy you are. And subhanAllah, right before I came here, I was in Egypt and I, my aunt was visiting me. And you know, she, she ran late, she was coming to visit us and she was late and I was telling her, why were you so late? She's like, you know, I visit this old lady, she's 92 years old. You know, I go feed her, bathe her, whatever, I just help her. I was like, oh, mashallah, that's awesome, but it's so sad that she's at this age and she has no kids to take care of her. And she's like, who said she doesn't have kids? She has three kids who are married and live with her in the same building, but they don't knock on her door. And her daughter thinks it's gross to change her mom or clean her up. So she will literally leave her in her urine or feces until a family friend comes and cleans her up. Wallahi, I can't fathom this. I just can't, my mind is boggled by that. Your mother, how many accidents did we have in our mom's laps? How many times did we throw up on her? And now when she's in need, you're not there for her. Subhanak ya Rabbi, how ungrateful could we be? And then the ayah continues saying what? Say not to them as much as, oh, right? And do not repel them, but speak to them a noble world, word. Imagine if Allah's telling you not even to say huff to them, huff, right? How about those of us who raise their voices and yell at their parents? How about the doors that are slammed or parents 
are made um, to be felt that they're a burden when they're trying to talk to you and you feel uninterested and you're like, you know, looking at your clock, like, are you done, mom? I need to go, right? Do we actually maintain the head of, of kind of um, conversation with our parents? The same way we maintain the head of a conversation with strangers? And who is more important? Think to yourself when you're outside and talking to strangers. Do you speak to them better or do you speak to your parents better? Be honest with yourself. No one can be more honest with yourself except you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues, says what? وَاخْفِدْ لَهُمَ جَنَاحَ الدُّنْدِ مِنَ الرَّحْمَةِ وَقُلْ رَبِّ الْحَمْقُمَا كَمَا رَبَّيَانِ صَغِيرًا And lower to them the wind of humility, out of mercy, and say, My Lord, have mercy upon them as they brought me up when I was small. The same mercy they had on you when you were a little helpless child, right? Unable to reach anything or to eat on your own or to go to the bathroom on your own or asking them the same question over a million times until you drive them insane. And I told my kids, they're like, Mom, 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 I'm like, guess what? And then like, oh, I forgot. I'm like, seriously, come on. How many times have we done that to our parents? And now, subhanAllah, as our parents are growing older, their memory will be going with them. And they will ask you a million questions. What kind of edit are you going to have with them? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Luqman verse 21, and we have enjoined upon man care for his parents. His mother carried him, increasing her in weakness upon weakness, and his weaning in two years. Be grateful to me and to your parents. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you see that? Gratefulness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not and then no, and to your parents. That's how you should be. Once a man asked Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what are the rights of parents over their child? He replied saying, they are your paradise and your help. Humma jannatuka wa naruk. Let that sink in. They're either your door to heaven or God forbid, help. And I know we all know numerous hadiths about Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi repeating your mother, your mother, your mother. So out of all parents, I'm going to speak about fathers today, okay? Just to be fair, to balance it out, right? And Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says that Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa said, no child can compensate his father unless he finds him as a slave, buys him, and sets him free. And he says, الوالد أوصل أبواب الجنة فأضع ذلك الباب أو حفظه Your father is the middle door of paradise. In other words, the best way to enter paradise. So it's up to you whether you take advantage of it or you don't. And how many stories have we heard of kids that regret treating their parents, right? And wake up when it's too late. Don't wait till God forbid something drastic happens to them and then you start changing your ways. Today, after you leave here, you all have cell phones? Yeah? Shoot a message to your mom or your dad if they're around. Mom, I love you. Dad, how is your day going? Change it. Make it today that changing point. The change you change your way with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and with them. And please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't deprive yourself from their barakah and their du'a while they're living. Okay? How about if they parted? How do I fulfill my rights towards my parents? You have du'a, sadaqah jariya, right? Keeping ties with their relatives, honoring their requests that they asked of you. Sayyidina Muhammad says, Inna rajul la turfa darajatu fil jannah fayakuru anna hada fayuqaru istighfar walidak lak. A man will be raised in status in paradise and he'll ask, Where did this come to me from you, Allah? And he'll say it's from what? Your sons asking forgiveness for you in this dunya. And another instance, Sayyidina Muhammad was asked, O Messenger of Allah, is there any way of honoring my parents that I can still do for them after they die? He said, Yes. Offering the funeral <coughs> prayer for them, praying for forgiveness for them, fulfilling their promises after their death, honoring their friends and upholding the ties of kinship, which you would have not were it not for them. SubhanAllah. And he said the best act of righteousness that a man should maintain good relationship with his father's loved ones. So our duties and our adab towards them extends to them after their death, not just when they're living. And I'd like to wrap up today's session with a story because I just love telling stories, right? That's what I do. <laughs> so 
the Prophet is going to be actually about one of the tabi'i. You guys know what a tabi'i is? So it's somebody who came, he wasn't a Sahabi, right? He didn't get to see Sayyidina Muhammad, but from the following generation, the generation that met with the Sahaba. So the Prophet was once sitting in a gathering with some of the Sahaba, the rich, the poor, all together. Sayyidina Ali was there, Sayyidina Umar was there, Abu Hurairah was there, many more. And the Prophet was in a conversation and he was addressing Abu Hurairah and he was telling him, There are those from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's servants who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves and they are dear to him. So, of course, the Sahaba want to know who are these people because they want to be one of those people. So they said, I asked Ya Rasulullah, who are those people? So Sayyidina Muhammad said, What? They are the ones who are pure. The ones who worship and do good in secrecy, with dusty faces, they don't have soft and silky skins, just simple people, with skinny stomachs, their stomach is what, like touching their back from how less or little food they have. Unknown in this earth, well known in the heavens. If they desire to engage someone, they cannot afford to get married. And if sickness fell upon them, no one visited them. If they were present, they were not recognized by anyone. And if they were absent, they were not missed. And if they died, only a few people prayed in their funeral. But to Allah, they were so dear. So Abu Huraira said, Ya Rasulullah, lead me to one of them. So Sayyidina Muhammad says, replied, please, what? Dharika uwaisul qarni. That would be uwaisul qarni. Uwaisul qarni. So, Huraira said, I looked at Umar and Umar looked at Ali and their companion called Uwais al like who is this man? This is the first time Sayyidina Muhammad is talking about someone from the Tabi'in. We said, we don't know him, Ya Rasulullah. Who is Uwais al The Prophet smiled and he started to describe him as if he could see him and he said, he stands upright with his health held up high in dignity. He's poor, but he's not dangling his head down. Dark-skinned, he's describing him in details. I see him placing his right arm over his left arm, reciting and reading the Quran in humbleness. And he continues describing him to them, right? I only have five minutes, so I have to get very short, unfortunately. Over his shoulders is a wool garment. He is poor and not wearing anything exquisite. And there's a white like sign on his left arm. Okay? And he said what? Ya Umar and Ya Ali, if you see Uwais al ask him to make dua for you. Wait a minute. Say Ya Umar and Ali, who've been promised Jannah already, are going to ask Uwais al that they don't even know to make dua for them. What kind of a man? So Sayyidina Muhammad continues describing him and he says what? لَهُ أُمٌ هُوَ بَارٌ بِهَا He has a mother. Like can you imagine, I'm telling you, can you please describe me this person? And he tells, oh, she, she has, he has a mother. Nobody's ever described by what? He has a mother. But he has a mother that he honors. لَوْ أَقْسَمْ عَلَى اللَّهِ لَأَبَرَ If he supplicates to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reply his dua. He honors his mother. If he makes dua, what happens? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will respond to his dua. Right? And he says, Uwais al Qarni will come on the day of the ju- on the day of judgment, and everybody will be entering heaven, and then he'll be told what? Stop. But why? He said, You wait and you make shafa'ah for what? For as many people as the tribes of Mudr and Rabia. These were two Arab tribes, there were about two hundred thousand people. A marcher who's a marcher makes what? Intercession for how many people? 70 of his own family. And you, Uwais, because of your birth for your mother, 200,000 people. So, what's the story of Uwais al I'm going to skip to that right away because of the time. Uwais al basically grew up as a very, very what, poor boy. He was an orphan, and he had a mother who was really old, and he had to take care of her. And he would ask and look at the sky, why you alone? Why me? There wasn't the concept of Islam there. And basically what happens is his father dies and then above all of that, his mother loses her eyesight. So now his burden increases. Now he's going to have to even care for her more. 
Until one day, he's taking his mom's hand and he lit a candle, right? And he's trying to walk her around and this incident happened. The light of the candle turned off and they both became equal what? In blindness, they both couldn't see. And all of a sudden, he found his mother, who couldn't see, moving him around. And he was confused. Me, the one who cannot see, I'm being moved by the one who cannot, or the one who can't see, actually, sorry, I'm being moved by the one who cannot see, who's actually blind. What is light and what is darkness? And he started questioning. And subhanAllah, he was 17 years old at that time. For yani Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's will at the time, Sayyidina Muhammad was sending what? Sayyidina Ali to Yemen to start calling people to Islam. The next day he goes out and he's walking and he runs into who? Sayyidina Ali. And they didn't introduce each other to one another. And he starts telling him, tell me about what? Islam. Recite to me something from the Quran that your prophet recites. And subhanAllah, what Sayyidina Ali says what? وَمَنْ لَمْ يَجْعَلَ اللَّهُ لَهُ نُورًا فَمَا لَهُ النور. And he to whom Allah has not granted light for him, there is no light. The ayah hit him so hard. And a voice of Qarnay says what? أَشْهَدُ أَنَّ مَا لَهُ اللَّهُ وَأَشْهَدُ أَنَّ مُحَمَّدٌ حَبْدُ وَرَسُولُهُ Okay, now, go to Sayyidina Muhammad. A sohba, the companionship. But my mother, who's going to take care of her? But it's the sohbah. If I were to tell you right now, I'm going to get you a plane ticket and you're going to go visit Rasulullah and he already passed away. What are you going to say? My mom's going to be fine. She's going to be okay. I'm going to go visit her. I'm going to see her and come back again. But Waisa Khadmi said no. My mother. He understood the religion right. And this was like a minute after he took his shahada. And from the age 17 to the age 33, Waisa Khadmi stays by his mom, taking care of her, tending to her. And Sayyidina Muhammad, actually after that, for three years, Sayyidina Muhammad passes away. And Waisa al-Qurna misses on the sohba. He's not a companion anymore. Can you imagine missing out on being a sahabi? Right? He sacrificed everything, but he did not sacrifice his mother. And Sayyidina Muhammad goes, I'm saying that, sorry, but Sayyidina Muhammad passes away. Sayyidina Muhammad takes the khilafa, two years and he passes away. Sayyidina Muhammad comes and now he's a khalif. And every year he goes to Hajj and he starts asking. It's amongst you, Uwais al Qarnayn. Ten years, every year, everybody stand up. Everybody stands up. And he's like, why is he asking us to stand up? Everybody sit down except from the people of Yemen. So everybody sits down. Okay, everybody except from the tribe of Murat. So everybody sits except the tribe of Murat. Everybody except from the what, tribe of Qarn. And nobody sees your name. Until one year, the last year of the Khilaf of Sayyidina Allah. See his keenness. Stick to one hadith. Pick one hadith and be keen on it. Just like Umar did, one hadith, one thing that Sayyidina Muhammad asked him, if you find him, have him make dua for you. One year he asks, and they tell him, yes, it's that poor shepherd down there. So he calls Ali, Ya Ali, we found him. And they run down to who? To boys. And they start asking him about signs and stuff like that. I have to go, I have one minute, unfortunately. But basically, they start what, telling him about his status. The boys had no idea until this day. And they tell him, Yeah, voice make to heart for us. And he says, But can a man like me make to heart for you? Don't ever underestimate or judge people depending on their financial status, how rich or poor they are. You don't know what is the status of people with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And look at the humbleness of Sayyidina Umar learn from him. He's the Khalifa. And he's asking this poor shepherd, make to heart for me. Why? Because who are me. And he starts making du'a for them. And Sayyidina Umar starts telling him, come with me. Live with me in Medina. Come, okay, I'll give you money. And Sayyidina, and Waisa Qurnay says, what? no, he doesn't want anything of his dunya. He has zuhr. I can't. You are from here, and I'm from here. You're good at what you do, Ya Umar, and I'm good at what I do. And everybody should be like that. We don't have to be all the same or good at the same thing. We all excel in our own fields. But the rights stay the same. And I want to just tell you one last thing, Suhba. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about your family in the Quran, He always says what Suhba. And Suhba doesn't mean that you just speak softly or don't yell. Companionship, when I tell you friendship, someone to go have a walk with or drink some tea or have fun with, you always think of what's your best friend, right? And I'm going to leave you with one final thing, 
for one final hadith, because I have to go. I have more to say, but I have to go. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says what? La yathrib al jannah qafi'ah. The one who severs their ties will not enter jannah. The one who severs his ties with his white family does not enter jannah.